I'm Peter Brown from Tiny and Sons Glass. Tiny and Sons Glass was established in 1978 with my father and brother and I. We're at 575 Washington Street in Pembroke. We're certified and qualified to do all your windshield replacement and repair. Tiny and Sons Glass is a community-based business. We have 12 mobile vans that come to you. If the weather's bad, you can come here to the shop. We have a nice waiting area, TV, Wi-Fi, kid-friendly, pet-friendly. We also can move about 15, 20 cars a day through the shop. Perfect for you when the weather's bad. So come on down to Tiny and Sons Glass if you need your windshield replaced or repaired. Tiny and Sons Glass, 1-888-64-TINYS. Just call. Thank you. without understanding why things have been done the way they've been done and then try to come forward with getting some we want to expand our age group a little bit um, we need to try to find some activities that will attract more of our 60 and 70 year old seniors um, to the center and try to get a little bit of a broader reach so I think we're going to start looking at more programming and visiting some of the other councils on aging to see what they offer and try to expand things a little bit hmm. We're all focused right now. Anybody else have any questions from the, from the board? Well, I'd like to say that uh, Susan has worked at the Council on Aging for two, two years before uh, assuming the job of director, and uh, she uh, comes very highly recommended by the outgoing director, and as the board knows, uh, we did advertise for the position and we did have other people apply and we went through an approval process and uh, we all agreed that Susan was the best candidate and so we welcome you and uh, uh, please look at the uh, board and uh, as someone who's here to help you in any way that we can. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank, Thank you. you. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, come again. Uh, okay, we have uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, Karen Shea here tonight. Yeah. Awesome. Good. Karen Shea Price. Mm -hmm. and, uh, thank you for having me. Um, I own South Falls Doggy Daycare, so I guess I might be one of the more unique uh, businesses that's uh, come before you to speak on behalf of the Chamber. Um, just, I won't take up too much of your time because I know you have important business. Um, I started here in 2000, uh, 2005, I started my business in Hanover. I've been a resident since 1998. Um, raised my kids here, uh, moved my business probably in 2007 to Pembroke, and most recently built a new building on Oak Street to uh, expand my business. So. Um, our daycare, we're full, Definitely. we aren't taking any new clients, but um, I would just like to say if anyone out there is looking for services in the pet care um, <coughs> industry, just feel free to call us. We like to um, help people out, you know, everyone has different needs and, and such and not all needs are the same. Um, we have a lot of dog walkers, pet sitters, and even other daycares that we work with that we can refer people to. So we also um, teach first aid and CPR um, for pets. So if anyone is looking to do that, our next class is April 4th. And uh, you just call South Paws and we can give you information on that. We also do training, um, all types of training classes for dogs. And that's open and available to the public as well. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, did you say your address and exactly where you're located? We're at 275 Oak Street. Okay. And um, do you have a phone number that people could call? Or? Yeah, the phone number is 71826-PAUSE. Um, that's the best way to reach us. Or you could Google us and find our website and just, you know, send us an email. I get all the emails myself, so I can answer them.
Anybody else have uh, Just like to say that it, I drive by your new facility every day and it, it seems uh, very busy. It seems <coughs> your business is doing well, so congratulations. Yes, thank you. Business business is great. We outgrew it um, by the time we moved in, <laughs> but okay. um, I have no plans to expand and I'm staying put, so you guys are stuck with me for, for a while. <laughs> <All right. laughs> and thanks for having me. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to say that uh, please note that this meeting is being made available to the public through a live video and audio broadcast on Comcast Government Access Channel number 15 and is being recorded for broadcast at future dates. Comments made in open session will be recorded. Um, we do have a couple of uh, public announcements, um, one being that uh, Household Hazardous Waste Day, uh, Collection Day, will be held at the Pembroke Recycling Center on Saturday, April 28th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Items which are acceptable and not acceptable are listed on the town website at www.pembroke, um, it's not really a slash, is it? Uh, I don't know what you call that, mark? Um, Mass.gov. Um, you must be a town resident have a current recycling sticker, and you cannot dispose of business or commercial hazardous waste. Uh, the fall date for household hazardous waste collection will be November 3rd. Uh, so if you got a bunch of stuff around the house you want to get rid of, Lou, do you have something from I the do, Mr. Clerk? Chairman. I have a message from the town clerk's office, Mary Ann Smith. Uh, the town clerk's office will be closed this coming Wednesday afternoon at 2.30 in order for the staff to attend the funeral of the assistant town clerk's father that will be in Somerville. And the town clerk uh, expresses her sorrow for any inconvenience that the closing of her office, but it's uh, something that uh, has to be done. Thank you. Uh, Matthew, uh, yes. Also. On Thursday, March 1st, 2018, the DPW Water Division will be conducting a flow test on Corporate Park Drive. The test will be conducted in the evening beginning at 10 p.m. The flow test may cause low water pressure and or discoloration of water for a short period of time. Residents in the surrounding area are urged to first check their water for discoloration before cooking, bathing, or before washing clothes or dishes. If you do experience discolor in your water, please follow the flushing method of running your outside water spigot closest to your meter or the cold water in your kitchen sink slowly for 20 to 30 minutes. Turn water off and repeat after one hour until the water runs clear. The DPW apologizes for any inconvenience this may cause you due to this test. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we have a 705 uh, First Church request for the use of Town Memorial Green on Old Home Days Fair. Is there anybody here to talk about that? If, um, just asking to use the Old Home Day Fair is returning again. Uh, same people that ran the Cushing Amusements who came last year was very successful. And when we the green from the fair runs the 31st of May through June 2nd. So they only run Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, but he needs the two days for setup. Um, it takes him a little bit longer. Um, he's very careful. Uh, he done some, it's more of the, a family focus kind of. And it um, lasted, he did a very nice job last year. We're very pleased with how it turned out, and Pembroke Connect liked it as well. So I thought that was a good thing. <laughs> so. Sure. Mm -hmm. Hello. Don Kernan, Commander of the American Legion. Uh, I'm here to support uh, First Church and this stuff. I don't necessarily agree on the venue, but I support the activity. Um, but I think uh, in years to come, we'll be able to partner up and make this a uh, much better place. So, um, I wasn't around last year, so I didn't have the chance to see your setup. I heard it was great. So, um, 
yeah. wanted to keep the heavy material uh, machinery away from the, uh, the mm -hmm. statues and the monuments. So I'm a happy man. Awesome. Can I have to visit it? Yeah, yeah. Well. yeah. We went over. Dan and I uh, looked at it to uh, see what the grounds looked like before the equipment came in and after the fact. And, um, I don't think there was anything significant, as I recall. Right, so, and if you'd like, we do the same this year. Yeah, we'll yeah. do that. All right, we'll get we'll get in touch. Uh, when is he coming? Tuesday He's, to he set starts up? Tuesday, um, and then he'll be setting up Tuesday and Wednesday, and he'll be pretty much um, there the whole time. He does the setup himself, um, so I will find out where exactly he's around. Um, and you can stop in and see him anytime he is around, and the guys will find him if you need to talk to him. Um, but he runs, he does most of the moving of the big equipment, so um, he's got guys that work for him, but he does the hauling. But he's coming from, he closes down on Monday, somewhere down here, and then he calls and then just puts up the stuff, so, um, adds to it. Mm -hmm. No, nothing's going to be on the green that one day. No, no, absolutely mm -hmm. not. Same day, Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday, and he, he doesn't get here first thing in the morning because he's driving all night. Gotcha. So he's, he starts when the sun goes down and keeps moving all but he has to break down in the place. Very good. Okay, there's no more questions by anybody in the audience or the board. Um, I'll accept my motion. Mr. Chairman, uh, I would move to grant the request of the First Church in Pembroke to hold the annual Old Home Days Fair in the parking lot and on the grounds of Town Memorial Green, surrounding the church from Thursday, May 31st through Saturday, June 2nd, and to close Curve Street starting on May 29th, conditional upon the inspection and approval of the Board of Health and details by the police chief and the fire chief, and to grant permission for the use of the community center rear parking area during this time for 10 trailers for the storage of Cushing Amusements equipment. The Selectman's Office will notify the Police Department, the Fire Department, the Building Department, the DPW, and the Board of Health. Second. Any questions or comments? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Zero. So it's real nice to see that uh, everybody's working together and uh, oh, make, yeah. it a, make it a good thing. So. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> okay. Um, is the DPW directors here tonight? Would you mind if I take the school out of order um, ahead of you? Because I know yeah. that you... Yeah, that's fine. Um, would that be fine? Um, if, you, if you guys don't mind, uh, we would like to... Um, we asked the uh, school superintendent, um, the security officer that is a uh, Pembroke police officer that is there at the high school, um, and we have a member of the school board is here tonight. And what we'd like to do is give you an update on security protocols at the Pembroke Public Schools. So, um, if you'd like to come forward, we appreciate it. There's so much talk and discussion about uh, security all around the, you know, the United States now. So it's it's uh, nice to have you here to explain Thanks for to us. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I'm just going to highlight a couple of the things that we're doing, and then we're happy to answer any questions we can to the extent that we can answer questions in a public meeting about security protocols. Um, so first off, I want to just say how fortunate we are to have the staff that we have. Um, I think that's the first step in any security protocol. So we have staff that are, have a vested interest in building relationships with our students. That turns into a student body that's very comfortable in our buildings. It's willing to say something when they see something. Um, I think that's probably the place where we've done the most investment over the past couple of years is um, in mental health staff for student and those pieces. Um, the other piece that's really important to focus on is the working relationship that we have with the emergency mer uh, management personnel in town, so both the police chief and the fire chief. Um, and I meet regularly and talk about our security protocols. Um, officer Kirby has obviously been assigned to the high school this year, um, but even before the school resource officer position was created, um, we have um, our 
we drill our procedures each year. We've had active shooter drills at the high school. Um, we are the training site for the South Shore Sunlax SWAT group. So they come in, um, I think it's Whitman Hanson, Cohasset, there's seven or eight towns that form that um, regionalization that come in and use the high school as a training site. Um, so we have all of those officers familiar with our space. Um, on top of that, a couple of years ago, we had a uh, security consultant come in and do a security assessment of our buildings. Um, there were some findings of that assessment that um, we then instituted a change in our practice with our entrances to our buildings. Um, so we moved our um, the initial buzz on the door from inside the vestibule to outside the door um, with the cameras. We've numbered all of our doors. We've done um, some small steps to do that. But um, we continually meet with the police chief and the fire chief to talk about what's out there, um, what makes sense for Pembroke and Pembroke schools. Um, we do, we've had some joint trainings with them. We've looked at different protocols, whether it's um, Alice training or currently we're a shelter in place district. We're um, looking at the 4L method, which is a new one that's out there. So we're constantly looking at what's out there to evaluate it and see if it makes sense for them. Awesome. Well, I know from past experience, it was probably uh, 11 years ago, I think we got our first lockdown procedure. And uh, so it's... Yeah, so, so now it's, uh, we have two drills of lockdown each year in the buildings. One is an internal drill, and then one we involve the police with each year at each school. So. Yeah, well, that's good. Um, does the board have any questions? Just that it's um, it's important it's important for the public to know that there there are plans in place, and uh, the school, the police department, fire department, uh, uh, combine their efforts uh, ahead of time and, and not during an emergency. So, um, and it, as you say, in a public meeting, we don't want to give away state secrets and how it's done, but it's it's uh, comforting to know that it is done. I think we recognize as a group that there's not one right way to handle a situation, and so the, the, the effort is really to get the most tools out there to our staff as we can so they make the right choice in the moment. Well, I have personal knowledge of being involved with, with, um, with all of the response to an incident, but what I was kind of looking for was, uh, and you explained uh, quite a bit that, that you're also doing is, um, what's the school doing before the response? That's that's what we're, we're really interested in is to make sure, because we know we've got a good police department and we know that, that the fire is good, so the EMS is, is excellent and all that kind of stuff, but we don't even want to get to that point. Yes, so the bulk of it is about prevention. To right, start with it's for us. right, prevention would be uh, looking ahead, so, um, and I know a lot of other things that you're doing down there that we can't really say on camera, but <laughs> but it's it's uh, it's nice to know that the uh, school is working so tight with with the police and the fire. So. Does Mr. Kirby have anything that he would like to say about the uh, first officer back in the school for quite a while? <laughs> Aaron's touched on, on most of it. I think it's a great collaboration between the police and the schools. We get ahead of these things just the best we can. And we learn from the incidents that have occurred across the country and we try to touch base with that, see how it fits into our community. And how do, how do you find out as an officer in the school um, with their relationship with the kids that, that uh, well, they, they have been there for like a year and that was my main focus going in is how do I build a relationship with the kids. Yeah. And quite frankly, it's been fantastic. I've been getting information, whether it be relevant or not relevant, it's building a relationship with them during school, after school, um, the parents, a lot of parents. So the information is coming, maybe not, you know, crazy information, but when we're getting good, solid, the kids are comfortable coming to me, which was my biggest focus. How would I fit in to a school system? Yeah, that's good. good because there's so many kids out there in society that, you know, don't want to talk to police. Correct. And at least if you're in there with them, um, doing a day-to-day -day thing that they know you're there to protect them and uh, you know and to help out you know when times get bad so one of the other things that chief wall just started doing over the past year is during the school vacation weeks um we invite the officers in to come walk the buildings and get used to the buildings without the kids there so there's some familiar familiarity even if they're not the school liaison officer um so all of the officers have been through all of the buildings so they have a little bit of base knowledge if they ever had to come in and that's, been, so. that's good that's awesome Anybody else have anything? No, I just think it's important that we build the relationship with uh, Officer Kirby as an example because you, you're involved in not only the school day, but I see you at the sporting events and the band concerts and things like that. I think that, that builds a, a you know, kind of a, a trust.
trust to you know, for one another, and that's that's good. So. I think just one other thing. One, kind of playing on that point. One of the things we've done through Officer Kirby that the town supported at town meeting and through some of the other budget changes we made it, it made with social workers and psychologists, especially at the secondary level, is try to develop that trust in adult. Um, and you know, Aaron touched upon it, and I think you can't go underestimated the impact that has had on our students, making sure we're creating that connection so that we can avoid things before they get serious. So I think even as you look at all these situations, there have always been signs. Um, and by putting in supports that we have, if we, we're trying to detect whatever we can for signs. I think we just want to express our appreciation for the support for that, as well as for Chief Wall and all the others for using us as a training ground. While it might look scary, and I was at the high school one time during the lockdown as they were coming in in full gear, yeah, it is a little bit intimidating. However, it sh gives them such a leg up should the unthinkable happen. Yeah. Listen, anybody else? No? All set? Well, thank you very thank much you for coming in. We appreciate it. Uh, DPW Director and Commissioner. Um, are here tonight to talk about their uh, fiscal year 19 uh, budget request. So if you'd like to come up, <coughs> Mr. Bastinelli is here. And Mr. Good evening. Do you want to sit up front in case we have any questions for you? <laughs> Presenting at town meeting, and um, there are. In, in this, you can correct me if this isn't the forum to discuss it, because some of it has to do with procedures that, that may or may not um, be occurring. But uh, there, we have an article in in this. Uh, warrant for $325,000 for supplemental chapter 90 funding and we went over this with um, the town administrator and the uh, town accountant in a previous DPW meeting and we wanted to be assured that in the event that this article were passed that, that this line item was was there permanently in the budget and and we were told that it would incrementally increase by two and a half percent annually and we don't see any sort of language in that article now I don't know again if this is the forum for this discussion but um, that's something that we were told when we engineered this that that's how the article would be presented on town meeting floor okay, is that is that part of yeah i i think the question right now is that um obviously the three hundred and twenty five thousand dollar line item for to supplement the chapter 90 funds the town receives five hundred and forty thousand a year uh, the payment management plan uh, clear, clearly states that the town will need around eight hundred thousand dollars a year to stay ahead of the curve to be able to do, you know, a proper uh, maintenance and resurfacing of streets. That being said, there is no room in the budget outside of a prop two and a half override. So that article would be a standalone article. It would be up to the Board of Selectmen to decide whether or not 
that article would be combined with the other two articles for fire, police, additional personnel. So the board, this is the Board of Selectmen's choice, and this is something we'll be talking about between now and our meeting, as to whether or not those articles, A, would be uh, subject to a Prop 2 and a half override, and B, is whether or not they would have three items on the ballot or one combined ballot dealing with fire periods for DPW. Now, Ben is correct in saying that if it passes, that because of Prop 2 and a half, that the allocation would increase by 2 and a half percent every year. Okay, so that's a normal thing. It doesn't have to be in writing? No. Okay, that would be normal. Okay. That answers that question. And then Ed addressed the second thing that we talked about this evening in our meeting, which was that um, in the event that the article passes and they do become part of a override, we would like to see the articles, any of the articles in the override listed independently and, and voted on accordingly as opposed to combining them all because there may be voters who want one or don't want the other and everything either gets passed or gets thrown out if it's all lumped together where if it's itemized then there's a possibility that the, the voters can pick and choose the things that they really want to go forward and the other things that they're not interested in at this at that point in time so that was the other part of the discussion and we had had that discussion back when ed came down to see us but these were the things that we just wanted to bring to highlight tonight. So in your considerations, should in fact we end up with an override list of <coughs> articles, we'd like to see them broken out independently. Now I don't know if that means each independent one or you take one and you list them and you vote for each one and you know, I don't, I don't know how you probably have to break them out independently, but that's what we'd like to see happen. Yeah, I think that's just what the board's going to mull on. Yeah, the, I mean, you're not going to have to, so, you know. Yeah, I personally would look at uh, a fire issue, a police issue, and a DPW issue as standalone issues, each with their needs spelled out why it's required so that the public can make a decision uh, not only at town meeting but the following Saturday it would be on the ballot yep. the, uh, so yep. we would if there were three items there'd be it'd be three separate articles and three separate items on the ballot I, I would have no issue with that yeah. um, the only, the, that can be dangerous, though, too, for for the proponents, because if you have three at an, an a la carte uh, ballot, it, it it could go completely against you. It, you know, it's, Dan, it's it's kind of it's kind of it, it, it's hard to determine. I I don't think from the DPW's perspective, we're not we're not really trying to figure out how to how to get it by anybody, it's out there. And and if the voters feel they have a need for it, they'll vote for it. And if they feel like it's not something they're interested in and they'd rather, and I just use the example, they'd rather have two policemen and two firemen and they don't wanna, they don't wanna take care of the roads, that's, that's their option. And, and I think in fairness to all of us, including the police and fire and anybody else who may end up on this ballot i think the you know if we're going to give it to the voters let them make their own decisions yeah but you see you misconstrue what i say it has nothing to do with uh, pulling the wool over anyone's eyes it's just a it's a, a, a more of a concerted it, it could be i'm just we're mulling this over now a concerted effort between uh, three different parties push rowing in the same direction could be more useful I mean, it could work the other way as well. It's true. Yeah, it's, it's that's, hard to say. That's why just give it to the people and let them make the choice. They're the ones with the votes. It's their money. And, and again, it's going to be up, you know, this is what we'd like to see. 
obviously you guys will have the last crack at it and figure out how you want to put it out there but that's our recommendation Appreciate you well, I'd, I'd just like to thank the commissioners and the director for uh, proposing this request for $825,000 because I can remember for years being on this board, every year you would come and ask for more money than what the state is giving us to fix the roads. And you had all of the statistics and all of the reasons we just didn't have the money oh, yeah. and it was proposed that let's take the money out of the excise tax revenue because that makes sense the cars are using the streets well we already use that money for something else so you know I think this is really the only answer and uh, even though you guys are doing the best you can with what you got, it's not enough. No, no, it's and not. I, for one, am, uh, I'm, I'm really frustrated at the conditions of some of our roads. But I know the ones that are being tended to, you are evaluating that, and you're spending the money that you got on the roads that you believe are the ones that need to be fixed. I'm not arguing that at all. It's just you don't have enough. We money. just don't have enough. That's correct. So we, I we, am definitely in support of this. We we spend a lot of time over the course of the year trying to figure out, you know, where where are the money's best spent and where the worst problems are and what we feel can wait. And sometimes, you know, we can't make everybody happy. But uh, I think we do a, a decent job at it for what we have. I agree with uh, Lou. There's a lot of roads in town that really need it, uh, need to. And if you don't have the money, uh, there's no way you can do it. So well, I, I, can I mean, you look at you look on some of the, you know, the social media yeah. out there, and it, and it's, uh, yeah. well, I have the roads being fixed, or I have the roads being I fixed. I can attest to the fact that, uh, that West Elm Street was redone about 10 years ago, yeah. and and you know, it's ready, and it's nowhere near the top of the list anymore. Yeah. It's just other roads that are that are way more deteriorated and, and if we don't grab them, once they start to unravel, they go quickly. And yeah. that's the problem with it. Well, it looks like I got another TV show to do now. Yeah. <laughs> the best part about it is that this all gives the DPW flexibility in paving unaccepted roads as well as accepted roads because right. chapter 90 monies can only be used right. on accepted roads right. Right. and this would allow us and, and we have the, the charts the maps and everything that show yeah. where the unaccepted roads are in town and the accepted roads and this would give the director and the commissioners a lot more flexibility yeah. in being able to uh, address the address the needs yeah. of the yeah. unaccepted, unaccepted roads. roads that's true that's true. Yeah, and there that's is a, a lot. Of, there is a lot of those around. Well, that's that's a good point as well. That that it gives us a little more flexibility because there are some unaccepted areas that really need, you know, work. Yeah. And and this will allow them to to prop up on the list as well. Yeah, I think in your report it's 18 miles. Yes, sir. Mm. You read the report. And it's just not one road. They're like clusters. Yeah. Of roads. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. And so. Obviously, Jane and Company can get a real big bang for their buck by, you know, doing an entire neighborhood, uh, like you did in Furnace Colony right. a couple yeah. of years ago. So. The other thing is, Chapter 90 has a lot of restrictions in place. What you can and can't do, like you can't do one lane. If you had one lane that was really bad, you got to do both lanes. And it's going to be a minimum 500 feet long. So, it takes away your flexibility. There's some streets you can get away with just doing one travel lane. But chapter 90, you can't. And chapter 90, we're going to a class on Monday and some of the new changes, I want to find out what level of pavement management you do kicks in the requirement if there's existing sidewalks. You have to make them and bring them up to 88 compliance now. So we're getting less bang for our buck, all the changes they're doing. 
but the big well, one is going to be si existing sidewalks being brought well, up. With a chunk of money like this, we'll be able to do things like that. We'll be able to take a road, and if we don't have full funds, if, if one side of it's bad, we can at least get it through the winter and, and then come back in the spring, and you know, then we're away from the potholes and we're away from the plowing issues, and you know. By the way, you did a great job on Hoblox Street and the, with the sidewalks and the new, new paving down there. It looks really good. Yeah. Bir Birch Street as well. Bir Birch is going to be okay. Do you have anything else you want to bring up to the board? Or? No. No, no just we just wanted to, to discuss how this was all going to come together and what our concerns yeah. were. Um, Anybody else have any other questions? Yeah, I'd just like to say that we're not talking about Route 14 here, folks. Yeah. That's, That's a, a whole state. total different thing. <laughs> that we have, uh, we have our own problems and concerns about how we're dealing with Baca Street and Center Street. Forget about it when it's all done, though. Yeah, yeah it's, it's all done. Yeah. We, we're, we're weather permitting, worst case scenario, we should be complete by September. If things continue in the trend that we're starting to see, which is the weather's been kind of kind, I don't want to jinx anything, but things are, are, are looking a little more kinder, we could be done sooner. They will be in shortly to do the water connections that need to be done down Barker. Um, we are going to do the short connections first, Landers has purchased a piece of equipment in which we're going to attempt to, um, I'll use, we're going to drill the longer connections so that we don't have to dig across the roads. And most of the structures are done on the Mattachesett Street end. They'll work on the rotary there and then they'll start um, micro milling and paving from that direction towards Route 53 and again worst case we're hoping for is September and best case could be midsummer. Can, so. can I just ask there's been a lot of discussion about the um, about the drainage <coughs> big um, dig or whatever they want to call it down there Furnace Lane can you can anybody explain anything about that to the public in regards to what they're going to do there now or if they're going if the plan is still going to be to do what they were originally going to do at the end? That's all end? set. Furnace Lane's all done. Furnace Lane looked, is all yeah, done. Yeah, we looked at uh, four or five different engineering uh, alternatives and none of them were budget-wise that made any sense. So the compromise was to go and install what they call the eliminators and every single catch basin from Hanson up to the center of town to catch debris and oil separators. And uh, so that's pretty much what they did. Uh, the water table and everything in that easement, we're going to get it. So this was the best bang for the buck, and it's been done on many other uh, big drainage jobs around Water. So they're pretty much they're pretty much through from the Hanson line to Pembroke Center. Yeah, they're going to go back and do some more curb cuts in yeah. the area of Lindy's. They had a little more work to do on the culvert and the water main yeah. by and, Lindy's and the rotary up at the end. But yeah. but that end is, is basically pretty much yeah yeah, yeah. and and. I can appreciate the process. Once they get most of this done, then they'll start paving because when they pave, it's just continuous. Yeah. And and once you get that operation going, you want to just keep going with that. It's it's a whole separate entity and operation in and of itself. And and once they get going, they'll just be continuous. So when they feel like they can't catch themselves on the other end, that's when that'll start and it'll just be continuous. Uh, can you tell me, Ben, if when we get done up at uh, McGuan Street, should we be looking at a roundabout or a rotary? I am not a fan of either. They're yeah. one and the same from where I come from. Okay. Their rotaries are roundabouts. That's a, that's a question that often comes up. <laughs> no, it seems to be working. We haven't had any accidents up there that I've seen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Well, thank you. I'm all set.
Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, next thing up on the agenda is uh, board action items, and we would like to vote to exercise or not exercise the right of first refusal for um, J. Myrat 40B property at 51 Redwood Circle. Anybody here? Mr. Chairman, uh, it's based on the information that's provided to you, it, uh, it is apparent that um, not exercising the right of first refusal allows the Department of Housing and Community Development to market the property to resell the eligible 40 b buyers. So we don't lose it in our inventory, basically. Correct. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion not to exercise a right of first refusal at this time. Second. Any other questions or comments? There are none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? So it would be not to allow. We need to vote to adopt uh, an engagement to represent the town of Pembroke in a Massachusetts civil suit against a wrongful distribution of prescription, prescription opiates. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, this has been recommended by uh, town council. Um, that uh, many communities throughout the state, and I believe the town of Rockland is the most recent one they did this last week, uh, join in a class action suit against uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, firms that uh, produce uh, quantities of uh, prescription opiates. Um, this is going to be similar to the same lawsuit, class action suit that the town joined uh, when uh, the uh, gasoline additive uh, lawsuit was uh, yeah, didn't cost a dime, uh, didn't cost a town a nickel, and we ended up getting an excess of six hundred thousand uh, dollars in uh, mm -hmm. uh, in claims. And, uh, and uh, we were one of the few towns on the south shore that joined that uh, lawsuit. And, uh, I would recommend to the board that we join the other communities in the state um, in this uh, class action suit. Awesome. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I don't, uh, I'm not voting against this, but I did have a question. Um, if we are successful and uh, money is uh, due the town, that's, that's one thing. We pay. 25% of that money to the attorneys, and the rest is ours. Right. <coughs> if, uh, then I also uh, was concerned about, in addition to the 25% that we pay to the law firm, plus to reimburse them for reasonable litigation expenses. Uh, that's in addition to the 25%. I just want to be clear on that. Well, I'll be able to, I can get a better answer for you, but I would believe that that's part of what the judgment would be against the pharmaceutical firm, so that not only would there be a payment to the town that the law, the uh, firm would get the 25%, but their expenses would also be part of the, the lawsuit as the judgment against the pharmaceutical firms. But I can, if the board wants to hold off on one more week, I'm, I can have that clarified by town council. Uh, maybe I'm just interpreting it wrong, but uh, on page three, paragraph two, it says, for instance, if the remedy is in the form of monetary damages, the client agrees to pay 25% of the gross amount to the firm as compensation, and then, reimburse the reasonable litigation expenses. I, I, yeah, I, I guess it, if the board wants to have a little week, I get a clarification on that. 
comment. Move to table for one week. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? One week. Awesome. Thank you. to accept the minutes of February 12, 2018. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would move that the board accept the minutes of the selectmen's meeting of February 12, 2018 as presented. Second. Second. Any questions or comments? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Yes, we have any old business? Hearing none, uh, Town Administrator's report. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you have a summary of the uh, two mass housing letters uh, that I uh, prepared for the board. So you want to look at that? It's a summary of those two. Uh, the, the first rejection letter in 05 and the, uh, the approval, letter. approval letter in 2018. Anybody have any comments about this? It's a damn shame that Mass Housing approved this 40B project. And if the Board of Selectmen can't do something about it, we will. We're going to talk about it further, as you know, in an upcoming meeting. Any other comments? Hearing none. We'll move on. Uh, is there anything in there? Ask the selectman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I just had one issue. Uh, some residents that live on Bird Street have contacted me. Uh, very happy with the paving job that was done on that street. But it seems uh, during the uh, winter storms and the plows were there, uh, there's been some gouges in the newly paved road which I reported to the uh, DPW commissioners tonight at their meeting and uh, they're going to look into it and uh, there might be some slight repair that would have to be done and then find out why that occurred so that's a, that's on ongoing so if I get an answer on that I will let the folks know that contacted me and I'll tell the board what happened as well. Okay. Um, under the old business there, um, let's go back to that for a second there. Uh, Dan, did did you um, ever get an answer from um, the old Colony Planning Council about changing the light at Mattachese, that where it enters Mattachese Street? As a matter of fact, uh, anywhere it ends the center street. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm reading the old colony joint transportation committee uh, memo right now, and they are going to perform a traffic study with data collection to be conducted um, this spring. So shortly. Okay. Uh, so they 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 are working toward it, but they can't give a definitive answer with, without conducting a, a traffic study on it. Uh, it actually says winter spring of 2018, so. Uh, now that the weather is starting to ease up a little bit, I, I can imagine it coming soon, Bill. You know, you know what bothers me about the whole thing is that it was changed without permission. So as far as I know, um, that falls under the Board of Selectmen, the lights in the, in the town. And as far as I know, as long as I've been here, nobody has ever come before the board here or uh, town administrator and asked to have those lights changed. So if it was changed, it was probably changed by somebody in the state. So then when you call the state, they they say that uh, 
they don't do anything with it now, it's up to the town to do something with it. So then you try to find somebody in the town to do something with it, nobody's qualified to do it. So the only ones that, you know, after you go around and around in circles all over the place trying to find somebody, somebody changed the lights to flashing up there in front of the post office, which made the traffic much better than what it was. So whoever that person is, if we could get him back to change the lights on Mattachesett and Center Street to the way they used to be, because in my opinion, they had no right to change them anyway. So whoever did that, I have no idea, but, but it's just something that is very aggravating that those lights are two or three times as long as if you went up to Route 53 where the traffic is three times greater you got to sit there and wait for somebody to come all the way from Mountain Avenue to come through the center while you sit there and wait for the light to change. It only encourages people to go through the red light. It you know encourages people not to wait. Plus they're aggravated and it ticks a lot of people off. So it's just whatever notes that you can make because I know that you're in contact with them all the time. But if it's something that they um, that they can do and it's you know, it's been quite a while now, so. I have a meeting with them Wednesday, this this Wednesday at seven o'clock, so I'll, I'll bring it up for sure. Just the sooner, because actually I contacted somebody in the old colony probably two years ago, and yeah, and it's just another, hey, we, need I, to, we need to find that person to change the flashes, so. You know, I wonder, Bill, if, if, it, if it is uh, upon the Board of Selectmen, it's con within our control, uh, we could hire a private contractor to come in if there's no one qualified, no town employee <coughs> that's qualified. Uh, there are signal companies uh, that should be available that we could contact. Yeah, I talked to three of them, and I think the best price I got was about eight thousand dollars <laughs> to have to have somebody really? come in. Yes. Holy cow! <laughs> um, that's why I contacted the old colony because <laughs> they come in and they do it for nothing for us. So. And they are, so I think, you yeah. know, you can hold off for a month or yeah. two until they can buy better reports. But there was, there was three different engineering companies that do that for work that said that those lights are way off and they're way wrong. So hopefully the whole colony is going to see that also and, uh, and change it. But Great. I'll put their feet to the fire to get, a, uh, to get an answer and to get them going on it. Thank you. Uh, anything under new business? Mr. Chairman, I have something under new business. Hmm? I have something under new business. Oh, okay. Good. So you all have this picture of this truck. Show it to the camera. And you may notice that it's not just the usual advertisement on the side of the truck. There's these new trucks with LED digital advertisements on the side of them that can change while the car is driving. They can blink and have different colors. And these are very distracting to drivers. Uh, I've read studies that double or triple the amount of distraction that a regular truck advertisement can pose on the already distracted driver. So I was hoping Ed could look into this, but is there any way we could have some sort of bylaw in town where these trucks have to turn off these lights when they come into Pembroke? Yeah, that's interesting because Sabrina and I were talking about it today, and we were trying to think of what you meant by LED. Did you, did you leave out an A or, <laughs> or something? So, okay, and, and it's great that you explained that, uh, Matthew, so we'll uh, be happy to look at it. All right, thank you. Sure. Awesome. By the way, was that photograph taken in the Massachusetts or? No, it's just from uh, Wikipedia, oh. not sure. Well, there's palm trees in it, so. <laughs> it's probably not Massachusetts. Well, when I, um, on another note, the uh, just to notify uh, some of the people out there, the Pembroke uh, Heron Fisheries Commission is out um, diligently working in the streams uh, before the fish get here. Um, we've done some changes to some of the areas, and um, from what I understand from today, uh, we have heard that that the uh, fish have been seen in Middleborough. Uh, so it won't be long before, you know, they're up into Pembroke again. And on the same note, I talked to uh, one of the guys from um, the environmental police that um, that indicates that there there is a group of people going around, uh, especially at night after dark, 
on a lot of the ponds and some of the streams and they're uh, capturing these eels um, and they're worth thousands of dollars over in uh, Japan or China and um, there's actually a big article uh, about a guy up in Maine where it's legal to do that. It's not legal in Massachusetts to do that, but it's legal in Maine. And he carries a half a million dollars around with him to pay the fishermen cash for these eels. So, um, you know, it's all see something, uh, make a telephone call. If you see something that doesn't look right, um, somebody's out in the woods at night with buckets and mm. whatever, or lights and uh, fishing all night and all that, then um, let the police know about it or let the environmental police know about it and, um, you know, give, a, give them a call because it's, uh, it's something that, you know, we, we don't need in Pembroke, so we definitely don't want uh, people disturbing our natural resources here, so. Uh, all right, so we do have some upcoming issues. March 5th, Plymouth County Treasurer Tom O'Brien um, is going to give us an update on the retirement, county retirement. Um, also on March 5th, um, school committee, uh, fiscal 19 budget presentation, uh, April 23rd, signing of the town meeting warrants, April 30th, advisory committee finance recommend, uh, presentation, May 8th will be the annual town meeting, and May 12th is the annual town election. So we already had our executive session tonight. There is no need for another one, right? No. Um, and that's it for tonight, unless somebody else has something else. You don't hear anything? We'll to adjourn, Mr. Chairman. Is there anybody Second. in the audience that has anything? No? Okay. okay, so we have a motion and a second to adjourn. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? All right, thank you uh, for joining us for the Monday, February 26, 2018, the Pembroke Board of Selectmen meeting. And from what I understand, uh, the weather is getting really good out there, and hopefully we get another week of uh, nice warm weather in the wintertime. I can't believe it that you're in short <laughs> sleeves uh, in February. So thank you and good night. <laughs>